Do I look at the camera? Just wherever you want. Okay. Okay, we'll roll it. Okay, this is an interview with William O'Brien, Division of Military and Naval Affairs Headquarters, Latham, New York. It is the 30th of December, 2003, approximately 10.50, 11 o'clock a.m. Um, Michael Russert and Wayne Clark are the interviewers. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Full name is William S. O'Brien, uh, date of birth, December 23rd, 1947, in Troy, New York. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I had a bachelor's degree in psychology from State University of New York in Plattsburgh. Okay. Did you enlist or were you drafted? I was in the draft lottery of 1969, and in those days they allowed us four years to complete your degree, mm -hmm. and if you had completed it, you still went in, and if you uh, hadn't completed it, you still went in. So we had the, we had the four-year limit. Uh, I received my induction notice from the Army. Um, that particular spring, a Navy recruiter came up to Plattsburgh with a, a T-34. So I went up for a ride uh, with, in, with him in the T-34, and I decided to uh, apply for the Naval Flight Program. Um, so I took all the tests, the flight tests, the written tests, and uh, was accepted into the Naval Flight Program. And as it turned out, literally at the same time, I received my, my notice to show up uh, as a a private in the Army. So, it was close. Um, what kind of uh, training and program did you go through? Could you describe the program? Yes, I went through, my commissioning program was the one that you see in the movies with an officer and a gentleman. They called it the Aviation Officer Candidate Program where they take people with four-year degrees who have passed the flight program and they send us to Pensacola, Florida where we went through 16 weeks of Marine, uh, basically Marine boot camp. And at the same time, you're taking trigonometry and other flight-related courses. Uh, and upon the completion of that 16-week program, uh, roughly four months, uh, let me make sure my dates are right, um, October, November, December, January, February, March, six months. So I misspoke. It's 24 weeks in total. Um, so I was uh, commissioned in March 26, 1971 as an ensign. Then I remained at Pensacola for the beginning of the flight, what they call basic flight program. Then depending on which aircraft you are uh, selected for, and that is determined by your flight grades in, in uh, pre-flight, then you you go through different pipelines. If you're a helicopter pilot, you went one way, uh, jets, you went another way. Uh, this particular aircraft that I chose is uh, a P-3 Orion. It's a four-engine turboprop, so it's actually jet engines, four jet engines running the propellers. Uh, but this is considered uh, a prop aircraft, so I went through the prop pipeline. So from uh, Pensacola, Florida, I received my commission, and then I went to Corpus Christi for advanced and then on to uh, Moffett Field, California for what they call replacement air group training, where you, uh, you get your wings in Corpus Christi, and you're, that's like getting your driver's license. Then you learn to go and drive the actual car that you're going to drive. So the first time I actually flew the P-3 was in Moffett Field, California. Now, why did you select the P-3? That's a good question, because at the time, the high, the push was for the uh, A6 Intruder aircraft. Uh, you mentioned that just before we started. That was the hot aircraft at the time. It was an attack aircraft, carrier-based, mm -hmm. and they were really looking for guys to fly the A6. I really loved the mission of the P3. It's uh, anti-submarine warfare aircraft, um, multi-engine, and uh, that mission really, really was interesting to me. So that's why I chose that pipeline. So upon completion of my RAG training in Moffett Field, um, my orders were to VP-17, which is Patrol Squadron 17, uh, based out of Barbers Point, Hawaii. And I, uh, I joined the squadron um, while they were on deployment to Vietnam. Um, they had been there about a month and a half when I first joined them. And that was my first tour in Vietnam. 
that's a very quick rendition of what that pipeline was. What, what were your, some of your assignments off Vietnam while you were in Vietnam? Uh, great question. Uh, we flew, this airplane has such tremendous endurance and multi-mission capability. It has great radar. I mean, the radar is good enough that you can spot periscopes. So it's got terrific radar. So we were used off Vietnam for a lot of things. I would say primary, primarily the mission was anti-shipping. Uh, anti uh, at the time, the operation in Vietnam was market, um, it was called market time, where they were trying to interdict any supplies coming from China, North Korea, or the Soviet Union into North Vietnam. Our mission was to look at the shipping, uh, get the name, the uh, course and speed, and any significant cargo off of virtually every ship in the South China Sea. And there were a lot of shipping. Because the route from Hong Kong to Singapore, we called it the Yellow Brick Road. When you're flying across the South China Sea, you could turn on your radar, and it literally looked like ants at a picnic. Uh, the shipping would come and go in one particular line. So in the course of a day, we would spend 12 hours <clears throat> at about 200, 250 feet off the water, flying close enough to every ship we saw to get all that information that we needed. If it was a, uh, a Chinese communist, North Korean, or Soviet Union merchant ship, we had a lot more intelligence requirements than just a normal merchant ship. We had to get very close. We had to take a lot of pictures from five different angles, as well as an overhead. And if it was a combatant, then we had even more requirements, including dropping sauna buoys uh, for and after the combatant to see if it was also accompanying a submarine. That was our primary mission. How did you find out what they were carrying? How did you the shapes on the deck. If you remember the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, mm -hmm. those pictures were from the P-3. Where the, you can see the distinct shape of uh, uh, either, either missile warheads or in some cases, they had gunboats right up on the deck of their merchant ships. Um, it's very difficult to, to hide the deck cargo, especially when it's that big. So that's the, the kind of thing we would look for. Um, and also, we would be very, uh, very tuned into their course and speed. If, if they seem to be heading in, a, in one direction, and then you come back and look at them again, and now they're going in a different direction, they're obviously they're trying to hide something. So we would go back and look even closer. Now also in 1972, which is my first tour over there, that Soviet Union sent down <coughs> five Echo 2 class, which is uh, what, what NATO considers the, the Type 1 nuclear submarine class. And an, an Echo 2 is a missile carrying submarine. <coughs> and those missiles could be used against US uh, uh, warships as well as U.S. ground targets. So in, in the spring of 72, the Soviet Union sent five Echo 2 class submarines into the South China Sea, unprecedented in this day and age. Now, you know, submarines go on patrol in ones, in only one unit, but this was, a, in effect, a wolf pack of Echo 2s. And it caused so much concern at the time that uh, our first tour uh, was supposed to end in uh, May of 72 and we were extended indefinitely and they brought another squadron over to uh, reinforce us uh, and we were flying around the clock on those submarines. So even though our primary mission was anti-shipping, mm -hmm. in that first tour the Echo 2s that came down from the Soviet Union got a lot of our attention. So our mission changed back to our primary mission, which is anti-submarine warfare. Um, what did you do now? Did you discover the submarines? And, and what did you do once you discovered them? In this, in this point in the, in the war, <clears throat> we didn't know what their intentions were. Mm -hmm. Now, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of warships in the South China Sea. We had 7th Fleet, mm -hmm. uh, usually two or three carriers that were flying combat missions, as well as Battleship New Jersey and a lot of other destroyers and amphibious ships. We wanted to know whether or not these submarines were getting close to those warships. So the, the other complication was in the South China Sea is a very noisy area because of all the shipping 
and it's also warm water. So you get a lot of <clears throat> noise in the water from uh, marine life. Whales, and shrimp put a lot of noise in the water. And the way we detect the submarines is we drop a microphone into the water from the air and it pops an RF antenna up and the microphone can go down selectable depths from 90 feet down to 1,000 feet and you listen to all the noise in the water. And we have operators that are very good at determining what is a merchant ship, what is a submarine, and that's how we track them. Um, not every flight gained contact, but we had enough contact that you could give the, track the positions of where these submarines were. Um, and we would keep our fleet informed as to where their location was, and our fleet would take evasive action accordingly. Even though they were missile-carrying submarines, they still had torpedoes, and that was the threat. Okay. Um, I guess, how long were you on patrol off Vietnam on your first mission there? Well, our, I joined the, the squadron at uh, uh, right around the end of January 72. Uh, we, we stayed through the end of August, and we, would, we flew very heavily. So we had a requirement for crew rest of two hours on the ground for every hour you were in the air, and we would hit the limits. So you fly a 12-hour flight, you were back in the air 24 hours after you landed from the first flight. So we were flying in excess of uh, 150 hours a month. Uh, and the mission would change every day. Some days you were doing anti-shipping, some days you were looking for submarines. Um, and as the war went on, there was a lot of other activity coming out of Thailand. So uh, on my succeeding tours, we had other kinds of missions that I'm not even sure now if it's declassified or not. Typically, how many people were on board the aircraft? It's, it's a crew of 12. We can carry up to 18 or 19, uh, but you have three pilots, two flight engineers, a radio operator, a radar operator, a navigator, a tactical coordinator, two sensor operators listening to the noise in the water, and an ordnance man who, on this version of the P-3, loaded all the sauna buoys internally. On succeeding models of the P-3, the sauna buoys were loaded externally, and they're fired using a gas pressure uh, cylinder <clears throat> so that as the plane is traveling through the air and you want the sauna buoy to go directly underneath the plane you obviously have to shoot it mm -hmm. backward <clears throat> to make up for the forward velocity and the inertia of the aircraft. Uh, so normally a crew of 12. Did you ever carry like civilian observers or anything like that or just strictly military people? Uh, either military or uh, CIA mm -hmm. but never, never civilians. Well, that's what I meant by civilians. Okay. Now, did you uh, carry any kind of weapons at all on the plane? This, <coughs> excuse me, this plane carried in the bomb bay eight torpedoes. Or in the, in the bomb bay, we could carry uh, special weapons, which were nuclear depth bombs. On the wings, we would carry uh, missiles, either the bullpup when I first went over to Vietnam, and the follow-on missile was the harpoon. Uh, and now I believe the P-3s carry the Phoenix missile also. So we carried um, mines on the wings. When Haiphong Harbor was mined in 1972, the P-3 was the first aircraft that was tasked with the mining mission. So we were over there at the time, so we were gearing up to do the mining. At the very last minute, <clears throat> they decided that the A-6s were going to do the mining off the carriers. <clears throat> they had a little more airspeed than we did. That was a dangerous mission because they took fire the whole time they were mining. This, this aircraft is, is fairly slow when it comes to that. Our, our true airspeed was probably a max of 450 knots, which is pretty slow when you're trying to avoid being shot at. Did your uh, unit ever lose any aircraft? P-3s were lost um, all through the war. Not um, in my squadron through combat. We, we lost a few prior to my joining the squadron through accidents. However, um, there were two P-3s shot down from, I'm fairly sure it was VP-26. They were flying at the time out of Sangley Point in the Philippines. Um, and there were a few islands in the South China Sea that 
the U.S. wasn't aware were being occupied by uh, Viet Cong. So that uh, the aircraft, it was believed, flew over these islands. They were little tiny things that were unbeknownst to them were, were hostile, and they were shot down. Um, Where were you based? We were all over the place. We flew out of uh, Cam Ranh Bay in Vietnam, uh, Da Nang. Uh, however, most heavily out of um, the bases that ringed the South China Sea, um, Okinawa. There was an airfield called Naha on the southern tip of Okinawa. Out of uh, QB Point in the Philippines, which is basically Subic Bay, the ships would pull into Subic Bay, and QB Point was the airfield. We also flew out of uh, Utapau, Thailand. And every one of those missions would either go into North Vietnam or South Vietnam or, th or the South China Sea coastline of Vietnam and then recover in various places. It wouldn't necessarily go back to the same airfield you left. What was your range in the <clears throat> Well, we had, we had endurance of 12 hours. Uh, the, so if you do the airspeed math, mm -hmm. You know, 400 knots times 12 hours, so you could go a long way. Depending on uh, how many times you're climbing, you know, how much weight you're carrying. But, you know, you could say nominally uh, 3,000 miles. Yeah. A lot of range. Mm -hmm. a, like a typical mission where we're back on a training cycle out of Hawaii, uh, we would fly 1,000 miles in one direction and operate there for four or five hours and then 1,000 miles back. That's an amazing airplane, as far as endurance goes. Plus the capability to go low and slow for a long time. Now the other thing we would do out there to maximize that is when we got on station, we called it, um, you're going to and from using all four engines. <clears throat> when you got on station, you would shut down number one, and then shut down number four, and fly on the two inboards. That would, so you're flying on two engines and that, that really stretches your gas. A lot of range on that airplane. Mm -hmm. okay, um, after your first patrol off uh, Vietnam, you left, you left in 72, August of 72. Um, what did you do then? Did you kind of cough drop? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we would go back to our home base, which is Barbers Point, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And we would normally have about a month of stand down. And the airplanes get maintained, brought back to uh, operational capability. And then we would take up operations out of Hawaii. Uh, what was going on then were a couple of things. The Russians would send these spy ships off the coast of Hawaii and try to pick up all the electronic information coming out of Pearl Harbor. And we would fly in those spy ships every single day. Uh, they, they were called AGIs. <clears throat> and the other thing that was going on is the U.S. was testing the Polaris and the Trident missiles. And they would shoot them from Kwajalein Island in the South Pacific. Normally the P-3 was used, we'd fly to Midway and observe the re-entry of at first the Polaris then the Trident. And you would be designated either to look at the uh, impact area of the warhead or clear the zone where the first stage of that missile would hit the water, make sure there were no civilian shipping in the area, because uh, they would put out a notice to mariners to make sure to stay out of the area, but somebody always would sneak in. And it's funny how often it was a Russian fishing boat who had you know, multi-missions. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do in the home cycle. Uh, and typically our, our home cycle was about seven to eight months. And then I went back for a second tour, back to Hawaii afterwards, and then back for my third tour. And in between, on the second tour, um, and then more on the third tour, the U.S. was picking up missions in the Indian Ocean. We flew out of the Diego Garcia Archipelago, which is south of India in the southern hemisphere. We would fly from there off the, the east coast of Africa and look at the shipping all the way from the Seychelles Islands all the way up to the Persian Gulf. And then we would land in Iran. There's a small base on the Persian Gulf in, on the southern coast of Iran called Bandar Abbas. And the U.S. was flying out of there, which was really like taking flight operations back 100 years. 
There was no, no operable tower, <clears throat> no lights on the runway, no one on the ground that you knew you were coming or going. You, you really had to try to get in there during daylight. Um, and at, at worst, they literally had somebody on a camel who would light oil drums with a torch so that you could at least see the outline of the airfield if you have, had to come in uh, at dusk. And when we were flying out of Iran, we would fly <clears throat> into the Gulf of Aden and look for Soviet shipping. And they also had an anchorage called the Gardafui Anchorage off the uh, coast of Africa near Djibouti. Uh, and as the Middle East took on more and more importance, uh, the P-3 mission extended up into that area too. And then we would we normally spend 30 days in the Indian Ocean <clears throat> going from Diego Garcia up to Iran, back to Diego Garcia, then back to Thailand, and then either back to Cameron Bay, Da Nang, or the Philippines. So predominantly your missions in that area were to keep tabs on Soviet shipping? Exactly. <coughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Um, I guess most of your assignments then basically were, I'm not going to say routine, but involved in, in basically these patrols around South China Sea. Uh, could you tell us about being involved with the Maguez? Yep. Um, the only other mission before I get into that that was different was when we were flying out of Okinawa, we flew what they called Peacetime Aerial Reconnaissance Program missions, PARPRO missions which were off the coast of North Korea. <clears throat> and they were very, very different missions. Uh, and so uh, potentially dangerous that we always flew with air cover. <clears throat> and we flew with a code book. And we would constantly get usually garbage code words that would come over the HF every five minutes. And you would look up the code word, and if it was garbage, it was garbage, and you kept going. But if our intelligence picked up hostile activity from North Korea coming toward us, then those code words meant something else, and we would have to get out of there. That was the only non-routine mission we would fly, the PARPRO mission. Um, so it was photo reconnaissance primarily? Only or? if we saw something. Oh, okay. We had uh, electronic countermeasure capability, so you could, you could pick up transmissions electronic transmissions of various bandwidths and that, that would indicate different kinds of radar which had different kinds of purposes fire control radar etc uh, as far as the Mayaguez incident went uh, that happened at the end of my third tour um, we were flying out of the Philippines uh, under the control of uh, that commander of the task group that was out of the Philippines. At that time, most of my squadron was in Okinawa. <clears throat> so, in effect, when you fly down into the Philippines, you come under the command and control of, of at that time, it was Commander Messagey, who was uh, in charge of uh, the Philippine Air Group. So our mission, we, we were sent out. We did our uh, typical Indian Ocean patrol. But on the way over, <clears throat> It coincidentally was, uh, uh, I brought along my, my logbook, and I, I really uh, sometimes have to look back at it to, to realize that on April 30th, 1975, when Saigon fell, and all of the, uh, those famous shots of the helicopters on the roof of the embassy. So we were flying off the coast that morning. We were flying from the Philippines, and we were supposed to land in Thailand. And that was an amazing morning because if you can imagine <clears throat> the normal routes you drive to work every day, all of a sudden somebody took a big eraser and just erased all the roads. And it was just one big area of blacktop and every car was heading in every direction with no roads. That's what it was like flying that morning because all of our air routes that we used and had used over there for years were just wiped away as soon as Saigon fell because all the navigation aids coming out of Vietnam were shut down. So you had nothing to home in on. So it was your own navigation, and we were be, being controlled by a carrier who was trying to make sense out of this mess in the air. 
and it was very tense. We didn't know if there were all kind of rumors that there were MIGs coming out, uh, so, um, you know, Vietnamese MIGs that were Soviet built. But there was none of that going on. But you weren't sure. But you, there were all kind of radar targets. So that morning we finished our mission of, of basically providing communication assistance and shipping surveillance that morning. And we landed in Utapau, Thailand that late afternoon, which is a, an air base that the U.S. Air Force is a tenant. It's really a Royal Thai Air Base at Utapau. And the Navy is a tenant of the Air Force, so we're a very small piece of Thailand. We flew in there that morning, <clears throat> and I'd been in and out of that air base for years. Well, for at that point, three and a half years. And what had happened when Saigon fell is the South Vietnamese Air Force just bolted. Their pilots got in everything that would fly and just left. And a lot of them went to Utapau. And they landed, obviously, without permission, not necessarily on the runways. They landed on the grass. They landed on the taxiways. They landed on the ramps. They landed in the trees. So that day when we landed, <coughs> It was as if you took an airfield and just shook it up because there were planes upside down, crossways, into each other, into the trees, into the hangars, everywhere. And the Vietnamese pilots just got it stopped and got out and ran because they were afraid they were going to be kept prisoner and then given back to the VC. Luckily, they kept run one way open so that, you know, operational traffic could land. So that was April 30th to 75. We left the next morning and went out and did about 10 days in the Indian Ocean. <clears throat> Ended up back in Utapau. I believe it was the night of uh, May 11th or 12th. I, I think it was the, well, anyway, 11th or 12th of May of 75. Our normal cycle at that point would have allowed us three or four days off where the crew can recoup, get some rest before we had to head back to the Philippines. And I'll never forget it. It was the night of May 12th. <clears throat> I was in the officer's club with my co-pilot. The crew had gone out in town. We were down. We, were, we weren't going to work the next day. So we were enjoying ourselves. And the duty officer came in and said, you guys have to fly. And we couldn't believe he was serious because we'd been drinking alcohol. And the rule was no flying 12 hours after drinking. But he said, no, you got to fly. you got to find the rest of your crew. So he was, he was serious. Uh, so my co-pilot went out in town. His name was Gary Ruffin. And tried to gather the crew. I went down and went to the initial briefing. And uh, what they told us was there was a U.S. merchant ship named the Mayaguez, that they received an SOS from. They had no idea why the ship was sending an SOS. They said maybe it's a ground, maybe it's on fire, maybe they've had an engine casualty. We don't know really what's wrong. But you've got to get in the air as fast as you can. So the crew came in. We pre-flighted the aircraft. Uh, we, uh, it took us from about 2 a.m. to 5 a.m., to get the plane ready, get it fueled. We took off about five, and we started doing a search, a visual search and a radar search for this ship. And it was all along the southern coast of Thailand and into uh, the Cambodian uh, airspace. And throughout my entire time over there, we had a strict... 25 mile CPA restriction to the mainland of Cambodia and any Cambodian islands. They were hostile. You could not violate uh, CPA as closest point of approach. You could not violate the CPA restrictions ever. <clears throat> My first indication that something else was going on was we got a message from our commander that said disregard the CPA restrictions to Cambodia. You don't have to worry about it. Then I knew something else was up here. Um, in hindsight, I dearly wish they had told us what they knew. I think, I think there's a, 
a typical arrogance in war where the higher echelons only tell the lower echelons what they think they need to know. And in this case, I think we needed to know a little bit more than that. So uh, we, through the, the good eyes of one of the other pilots, uh, Jim Carlson, we've been searching about three and a half hours. <clears throat> and his, with his eyes, not with radar, he looked and saw what he thought was a ship tied up along a little bit of an island. So we decided to go check it. As we got closer, you could see that it was, it was a merchant ship, and it was anchored in a, in a small lagoon in one of the two islands that we called the Pulawai Islands, um, or the Peanut Islands, because they looked like two peanut husks floating in the water. They were kind of a navigation uh, visual uh, landmark. So we took a pass up the starboard side of the ship, and we were getting lower. <clears throat> Couldn't see anything. Couldn't see any sign of the crew, nothing. Just anchors, anchor ropes going down into the water. So we needed to make sure of the name of the ship, and as our briefing, get close enough to find out whether or not they could tell us what was wrong, and maybe hold up a sign. Mm -hmm. So we swung around a stern of the ship, and we came in low, about 200 feet off the water. We were maybe uh, 500 yards of beam, uh, maybe less, of the ship. And as we came up a stern of the ship, you could clearly see the name Mayaguez on the stern. And then as we came around amidships, there were two small gunboats tied up amidships. I believe they were, came to find out later, U.S. built 1950s vintage PT boats. They were tied up amidships. Uh, the Cambodians had seized the ship during the night. The crew was still on board. And there were uh, approximately, I'm not sure of the numbers, several hundred Cambodians on the ship, as well as in the tree line of the island. So as we came around amidships, they just opened up. They started firing with everything they had. And it was about 9.30 in the morning, but they were using tracers. You could clearly see the tracers going across the windscreen. You could see them in the water. And then the rounds started piercing the aircraft. They came, went through primarily uh, the vertical stabilizer. Um, our squadron had a big white lightning was our symbol painted on the tail of the aircraft. And most of the round went through the white lightning. And the dangerous thing about the P-3 is the wings are full of fuel. We have a fuel bladder inside the wings that carry all our fuel. And we'd only been in the air three hours, so our, our wings were full of probably 40,000 pounds of jet fuel. So any round at all through the wings, we would have exploded. Luckily, um, they were firing at us and not leading us. So I think most of the rounds, although we could see them across the, the glare shield, I, I don't know what miracle. Uh, they never really hit this part of the aircraft, they hit the vertical stabilizer. Um, and I don't know why they missed us. The, the passage in this book that refers to it, which is a, a quote from the captain. Could you hold the front of the book? Oh, up I'm sorry. First? This is a book written by Roy Rowan. He's a Time Life correspondent who was over there at the time. And it's entitled The Four Days of the Mayaguez. And he refers to this, this moment where we came around on that ship, uh, and this is refers to the, uh, the captain of the ship. When he went back up to the bridge to begin his own 8 to 12 watch, the action had started. He looked up and saw a four-engine Navy plane making lazy passes over the Mayaguez. On each pass, the plane would lose a little altitude until it swept past the Mayaguez, maybe 500 feet off the water. Well, we were a lot lower than that. Well, he sure found himself a hornet's nest, the first mate hollered to the captain. Forty Cambodians who had been aboard the Mayaguez since early morning blazed away with M-16s, AK-47s, and M-79 grenade launchers until they were all slipping and sliding around on the deck on the spent cartridges. Now, see, I guess that's one of the reasons they were missing, is they were losing their footing on the spent cartridges. 
the two gunboats opened up with their twin 50 calibers. It's my belief that it was the 50 caliber rounds that went through the vertical stabilizer because you could, you could put your arm through each hole. It was that big of a, of a hole. The two gunboats opened up with their twin 50s. On the beach, there were more 50 caliber machine guns firing away. Some of the young Cambodians, <clears throat> the captain noticed, closed their eyes when they fired. The Navy plane continued out over the water. The captain said there's no way he could have flown through that shit storm, excuse me, without getting hit. And we did. Um, however, the control cables weren't damaged. So we could still operate our rudder and our, our ailerons. Luckily, the, the rounds that went through didn't sever any of the control cables. So we went out and we called back to the Philippines. We told them what had happened. They couldn't believe we, we'd taken fire. They couldn't believe it. Um, when, they, when they understood what we were talking about, then they made the connection from the Philippines to the National Military Command Center back to the, uh, whatever they call the room in the White House, the National Security Room, or this, the, what do they call it, the, the sit room or the war room. At the time, it was President Ford, because President Nixon had resigned the previous uh, summer. So it was President Ford, Kissinger, uh, Schlesinger, who was uh, Secretary of State, and Bud McFarland, who was National Security Advisor, were in the room. And <clears throat> they were asking in, uh, questions of this general at NMCC who were referring the questions on to us. Questions like, could you tell what they were, the people that were shooting at you, what they were wearing? <clears throat> that mattered, I guess, whether they had what you look like uniforms on or whether they look like civilians. They were trying to determine the international political aspects of this. Is it just a rogue civilian crew or is it Cambodian soldiers? So we told them as best we could that they looked like they were all wearing the same uniform, black, sort of black pajamas. Now you could hear all these conversations even in yes. the White House going on. Yes, I could hear it on HF. You could clearly hear Kissinger's voice especially, a very distinctive mm -hmm. voice. Uh, so we were told at that time to stay on station and keep monitoring the ship. And they would try to send out a relief aircraft from the Philippines. So. We returned to the ship about 35 minutes later after making our, our radio calls. And I'll never forget that radio call. I just want to say one thing about it. I think it was probably a, a petty officer, third class or second class on the radio. And I'm the one that made the radio call. And I gave him the, the position, the course and speed of the mine was dead in the water, the latitude and longitude of the ship. And as our typical, we called them contact reports. The remarks section is where you add in any of the amplifying information. In this case, I went right down through the contact report protocol. And at the end, I said, uh, small arms fire, uh, and we've taken hits through the vertical stabilizer. I don't know whether I was super calm or whether I was numb, but this poor kid at the other end of the radio just couldn't. He asked me to repeat like three or four times because he couldn't believe what I was saying. And finally, he, he left the radio, and a, and a commander came on, and that's the last I heard of the kid. But from then on, it was the, the XO of the squadron in the Philippines that I did all my talking with directly. So when we returned to the island, after 35 minutes, the ship was gone. After all the firing, they got that ship underway. They got the boilers up. They pulled up the anchor ropes. They got the, the gunships away from the midships, and they were hauling. They were trying to get to the mainland of Cambodia now that they'd been discovered. So our instructions were to keep tabs on them and, and do everything we could to maybe make them change their mind. So we made a few passes across the bow. In the meantime, I called the, the people we were talking to, and I said, I think the biggest gun they have is a 50 caliber. How high can that shoot? I didn't know. Mm -hmm. They didn't know either. So they did some quick research and they said, we think about 5,000 feet. So we went up to about 6,000 feet on the next pass. And sure enough, they shot at us. They shot at us every time they saw us. And it was such a clear morning. 
you could see the tracers coming up at you and then after a while they'd start to tumble and then they would fall off so they were pretty accurate with that but they shot at us every single time we were back probably four or five times <clears throat> and then they eventually decided they weren't going to try to go for the mainland so they pulled into this other island called Kotang Island two words K-O-H-T-A-N-G and uh, they anchored there so we continued to observe them at Kotang Island <clears throat> But we weren't allowed to leave until the other relief aircraft came out from the Philippines. And all this time, I'm on the radio. Uh, but we were running out of gas. We did not have enough gas to stay as long as they wanted to. And still, there's a requirement out there because airfields are so far apart. They call it prudent limit of endurance, PLE. You have to have enough fuel in your tanks to get back to your airfield plus X amount of pounds of gas in case you have to go to another place. So I said to him, I'm at PLE right now. I, I have to leave right now. So they said, no, disregard any PLE requirements, which means there's a good chance that we were going to go in the water at the end of this day because we didn't have enough gas to get back to the airfield. So we were just hoping against hope that this relief aircraft would get out there, you know, as quick as they possibly could. And I'm sure, you know, my imagination, it took a lot longer than it did. Uh, but from the first time we were shot at until that relief aircraft arrived, it was over three hours. Uh, anyway, the, when he finally got there, I had already started making my way back to Thailand. And uh, he called up and he said, gee, I don't see the ship. Where is he? Oh, my God, I wanted to, you know, wring that guy's neck. I kept telling him, he's right in the little cove. You can't miss him. Oh, my God. Well, finally, he said, oh, yeah, I see him. Okay, great. So we were booking back to Thailand. When we landed, um, we were so out of gas that on this aircraft, you exit the aircraft through a door right here. And you drop a ladder out, out of the airplane. The ladder is carried inside. And the ladder usually comes down at an angle like so. And depending on the weight of the aircraft, as it squishes the tires down, the angle of the ladder can be less or more vertical. We were so out of gas, they had nothing really in the tanks but fumes, that that ladder, ladder was virtually vertical. So we didn't even want to dip the tanks to see. If we were close to flaming out. In any event, there was an Air Force general that met us when we landed in Thailand, and he wanted to film. We'd taken film with our personal cameras, which is another point. This changed the Navy's approach to what cameras they put in the cockpit. Up until now, they were archaic, old boxes. But we had guys, having been overseas for so long, that we all bought 35-millimeter you know, SLR cameras, Canons and Nikons, and we had them in, the, in our personal. Those were the pictures that they used that the Navy used, the pictures that we took with our personal cameras. So then they, they decided we better put good cameras in these, in these cockpits. But uh, the general at, at Thailand that was a U.S. Air Force general, he wanted the film that we took, and I couldn't give it to him because the Philippines had ordered us to land at Thailand, refuel, put metallic tape over the bullet holes, and take off again and get all the film back to the Philippines because the Marines were going to assault that island and they needed to film back in the Philippines to brief the Marines. So there I was, a, a lieutenant, a Navy lieutenant, telling this Air Force general, I'm not giving you the film. So that was a high point of my career. He was, he was threatening court-martial and everything in between. Uh, at the time, Utapau was cranking up. The, they had some F-111s and F-4s, and they were starting to get their fighters on the line. We took back off. And we had to fly right back over that island trying to get the film back to the Philippines. We flew over the island. Now it's nighttime. And they were, they were shooting. Uh, it looked like the 4th of July. They had a C-130 gunship in a port orbit around the island just firing into the tree line. And the F-4s and the F-111s were firing continuously. We made it back to the Philippines. We, with the film, we did the briefing. Uh, they sent the Marines out. <coughs> and... This second book, 
which is called The Last Battle, um, The Mayaguez Incident and the End of the Vietnam War by Ralph Wetterhahn. Until I read this book, I didn't really understand what happened on that island after the last time I saw it. And it was really a... Do you think that book is accurate uh, as far as you know? Is he, he's inaccurate as far as the fact that he used this author's information about my flight. Mm -hmm. The passage I read from what the captain observed, that was accurate. But the other references in here had the aircraft that I flew coming from a different squadron with different names, and it was completely wrong. So those details are wrong. But what this author did is he actually went back to the island and he tracked the actual Marines that made the uh, invasion, interviewed them, interviewed their families, and even went into Cambodia and found the Cambodian soldiers that were defending the island, and he interviewed them. So as far as the after, um, after the, the ship <coughs> was hijacked, what happened on the island itself, I believe this author is extremely accurate. And it's a very tragic story. The Marines went in and took terrible casualties, just terrible casualties. Um, I guess, I don't know whether they, they uh, underestimated what they were going in for, but the Navy sent two destroyers. Here on the cover of this book you can see one of the destroyers, the Herald Holt, alongside of the Mayaguez, and they actually towed the ship out of there. Meanwhile, the crew had been taken to the mainland of Cambodia and put in a prison camp in Cambodia. So we were not only bombing the island, but we started bombing mainland of Cambodia with B-52s, trying to get them to release the crew. Uh, the Marine assault, they took terrible casualties. They went in with helicopters. One helicopter was shot down and, and crashed on the beach. The other helicopter took heavy fire and tried to lift back off and crashed into the ocean. So here you had all the Marines with full field packs going into the ocean. A lot of them drowned. A lot of them were shot on the beach. There were a lot of casualties. Um, I think personally the worst, the worst tragedy of the Marine assault was they, we left three guys behind. There was, there was a machine gun post on the far end of the perimeter and we finally were extracting the Marines off that island through a miscommunication or whatever, that last helicopter that managed to find its way in asked that last officer that was brought on board, is that it? And he said, yeah, that's it. It wasn't true. There were three guys down there still firing, still alive, still in their foxhole on the beach, doing what they were told to do, cover, cover the guys as they were extracting, and they were left behind. Uh, to me, that's the biggest tragedy of of that whole incident and of any war is never leave anybody behind. Uh, they were eventually captured, tortured, and killed by the Cambodians. And uh, I, I, I think it's, it, you know, if anyone reads this book, those are the three heroes, those guys that were left behind. Um, and I, I probably uh, am remiss here in not knowing their names, but. Uh, this book lists all the casualties from that assault, especially the three guys that were left. Um, but this, this book, when I read it, which was only a few years ago, it's, it, it only was written in, uh, at the end of the 90s. I was shocked to learn the details of that. So we got back to the Philippines we briefed them on uh, what we what we knew. They they used that information to go into the uh, into the invasion. And I was you know I was rapidly approaching the end of my third tour. Uh, I flew one more operational flight out of the Philippines, which was the next day, which was extremely strange. Um, somebody thought they saw a Soviet submarine in in Subic Bay. And the aircraft I happened to fly carried forward-looking infrared FLIR. It's now on uh, virtually every P3 has FLIR. 
We were the only plane that had it then. So they launched us in the middle of the night to see if we could see a periscope in Subic Bay. It was crazy. There was no submarine. It was just somebody hallucinating. However, we kept in, we stayed in the air, and they told us to go out. At that time, the refugees pouring out of Vietnam were, it was an immense a human tragedy. They would get in these boats that had no navigation, no food, no water, and just launch themselves. They were so desperate. And we were told to go out and fly around and count the refugee boats we saw. And it was a real tricky situation because if you flew close enough to them that they were sure that you spotted them, they'd set their boat on fire and jump in the water. So you were forced to try to throw them a raft or food. So you had to kind of stay away and just count from binoculars. So we did that for three or four hours after the submarine incident, same flight. Then they called us up and said, you've got to break off what you're doing because the Soviet cruiser, the Sverdlov, had turned, it was heading back to the Soviet Union, but we had information that it turned, it was heading toward Vietnam. The Sverdlov is a huge ship, it's the size of a U.S. battleship. So we went and tried to find the Sverdlov, eventually did. It was accompanied by two frigates and two oilers. And I'll never forget this to this day. I had my binoculars on the Sverdlov, and I was about to take them away, and I could see the guns turn, and the ship came hard port, and, and the guns fired. And I had a quick look to see what they were shooting at, and all there was was a huge explosion and a bunch of splinters and smoke in the air. There was no sign of what used to be. There was a, a U.S. jet in the air above us. He called me up and said, did you just see what I saw? And I said, yeah. And he said, what, what happened? What do we, how do we report that? So I didn't know either. So as it turned out, I flew back. We reported what we saw. And they determined it was a hulk of a refugee boat that the Soviets were just blowing up as a hazard to navigation. They were just guessing. That was my last operational flight. Uh, at the end of my third tour. Uh, and, you know, I thought that I thought that the last flight on the Mayaguez was interesting enough. I, I didn't need any more interesting flights, but that was the last one. Uh, so from that, I went back to uh, Hawaii. Uh, I checked out of the squadron the next month. My next duty station for the, for the Navy was uh, a SOSA station in Northern California, uh, which is a station that has cables that go out into the ocean uh, a long way with oil-filled drums that listen for Soviet submarines. So it's a, it's a land-based facility that does basically what a P-3 does. And we had these all up and down the west coast and the east coast of the United States. We still have them. And it's, it's an early detection for submarines. And all these bases are manned with operators who 24 hours a day, seven days a week, look at the grams to see what's in the water. Uh, I, I was at that duty station for uh, three years, and I got out of the Navy active duty part uh, in 1978. Uh, I joined the reserves flying the P-3 out of uh, Willow Grove Naval Air Station in Pennsylvania. And uh, I continued to fly the P-3 against uh, doing the same mission uh, you know, on a reserve basis from 1978 uh, through 1990. Uh, I became CO of that squadron. And we deployed out of uh, Iceland, Sicily, uh, the Azores, and watched the Atlantic uh, submarine activity. Uh, after I left the squadron, my next duty station was with... Uh, the surface side of the Navy, not the air side. Uh, and I had various duty stations. Um, one was with 2nd Fleet out of Norfolk. Uh, it was the NATO arm of 2nd Fleet. The, the Admiral in charge of 2nd Fleet is also the Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic, who is the, the seaborne commander for NATO forces. So I was on his staff for, uh, for three years. And then I was a CO of the Reserve Component at the uh, at Naval Air Station in Rota, Spain, 
following that tour, I was uh, the CEO of uh, the Iceland Reserve contingent. And then my final duty station was uh, Suda Bay, Crete, in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, as, the, as the CEO of the reserve group that supports that base. And I retired from the reserves in November of 1999. I mentioned something here that you were involved with uh, actions in Kosovo? Yes, when we were in Crete, uh, the base at Suda Bay, Crete is an amazing deep water port and it contains a tremendous amount of ordnance in storage facilities for use by 6th Fleet. And it's also a port that can take a full, the full draft of a, of a U.S. carrier. They can tie up right alongside, take on fuel and ordnance, empty their bilges. So when we started bombing uh, Kosovo, we activated our reserve contingent to Crete to support the air and the surface Navy refueling for Kosovo. And Crete has a large communist population. So our, our sailors were in uh, a, a little bit of, there were several incidents of people lobbing things over the walls and uh, a lot of communist activity in Crete. But that was our Kosovo involvement. Now you had some things you brought with you. Let me hand them to you. Uh, Yep. This is the this is the helmet that we wore in my era of the P3. Uh, it's extremely heavy, so consequently we had uh, we used every excuse possible not to wear it. We had to wear it any time we were dropping ordnance uh, or any time we were in a, a situation where we might go in the water. Uh, this has communication in it and our oxygen mask attached here. It also has visors for. Um, when you're bailing out, <clears throat> you want your visor down so that uh, the parachute shrouds don't hit your eyes. Clear for night and sun for day. Uh, this thing weighs about twice as much as the helmets do nowadays. These are the sound attenuators we had to wear around the aircraft anytime. Um, the auxiliary power unit on the P3 takes out your hearing in a certain band, and anybody that flies that aircraft has lost their hearing in that band. I have, everybody does. Try to wear this as much as you can. Is this the phone you called the president on? Well, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is our secure phone. We call it the red phone, obviously. This is in the cockpit, uh, right above the pilot seat. You reach it from here, and it plugs in. And this allows you to talk <coughs> a plain voice over a secure net. And th this is just one of the things we carried in our in our vest, uh, I had to turn the rest of the stuff in, but uh, this is a typical survival knife. Obviously it's non-glare with a with a butt end to use as a hammer and uh, a serrated edge for sawing. Did you uh, carry what, what they called a blood shit? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. A blood shit was a piece of silk um, that if we were uh, captured, you could hand this to Vietnamese and they could turn it in for money. And there was all kind of rumors as to how much money they would get for turning you in alive. Mm -hmm. But yes, we carried blood shits. We had to turn them all in at the end. I'd, I'd love to have one as a, as a souvenir. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>